Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. Here in the United States, the controversial topic of the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon, or UAPs, UFOs, spaceships, spacecraft, humdinger, wide-winger, flying saucer, boomerang, or disc, largely came into focus soon after the notorious 1947 crash of an alien ship in Roswell, New Mexico. It's been the single most talked about extraterrestrial encounter for over the past 75 years, and that must be because it was the first one, right? Wrong. Coral Lorenzen is one woman who gladly testified to that. Molly Briggs from Paranormality Magazine brings us the story. Coral E. Lorenzen and her husband Jim founded the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization in 1952 after her passion for the unknown led her to discover that there was more to the UFO mystery than meets the eye. Her strange journey started one summer day in the small town of Barron, Wisconsin in 1934. When Coral was just nine years old, she and two of her playmates had encountered a UFO, watching it lazily drift along the horizon. Strangely enough, the summer Coral had her first of many UFO encounters would turn out to be the hottest summer in climatological history. During the spring and summer of 1934, the United States was experiencing severe dust storms and record-breaking drought. Temperatures were climbing to an alarming twice as great as the previous warmest temperatures on record, causing the country to feel like it was in an international disaster, according to the American Meteorological Society. Could the devastating spike in temperatures be the reason for the 1934 interplanetary visit? Were our galactic brothers and sisters monitoring our questionable treatment of planet Earth? Coral and her friends were playing outside when she looked up and spotted something strange in the west-southwest sky. She described it as an open umbrella without ribs or spurs. Referring to the object as a thing, Coral witnessed the strange floating craft wobble west, making no sound. She recalled that the sky was clear with no clouds. So what was the strange, glowing object? The town of Barron, Wisconsin was small with a population of 1,500. Aircraft were rarely seen in the area, and the townspeople had never encountered a weather balloon. Locals would occasionally spot a small monoplane, gleefully looking on as the rare sighting would elicit pleasure, not panic, given the town was small and not stupid. A monoplane was likely not what the kids had seen on that sweltering summer day, though. Coral and her two friends stood in the sticky summer heat, gazing up into the sky. As sweat began to drip down the sides of their faces, one of the youngsters cleverly surmised that the object might be a parachute. The slightly cleverer Coral replied that there were no ropes or lines suspended from it, deeming the child's guess unlikely. The glowing white object was the size of a dime held at arm's length and bounced around in a strange motion. The three unattended children noticed the thing was moving relatively slowly. One of the witnesses declaring that it was undulating, poking along at a leisurely rate of speed with a rather strange motion. The children stood waiting for the object for what they described as twenty or so seconds. The strange craft bobbed its way toward the horizon, and disappeared. This detail, however, is speculative. Coral stated that because of her unfortunate vantage point, she and her playmates could not determine if the unidentified object continued to sail over the horizon or land near what the locals called the Upper Dam. Relative to the amount of time Coral and her friends were in sight of the flying object, 
there is no way to determine for sure just how long the encounter may have lasted. There have been many accounts of one or more witnesses spotting a UFO in the sky, and after what they believed to be mere seconds, they realize a significant amount of time had passed. The internationally known 1961 alien abduction of Betty and Barney Hill in northern New Hampshire is a prime example of such an encounter. One autumn night headed south through the White Mountains of New Hampshire, Betty and Barney Hill were traveling home from their honeymoon. Betty had been tracking a strange light in the sky. In the blink of an eye, the pair found themselves many miles down the highway, almost home, with two hours of missing time. The couple had no recollection of how they had gotten there. Betty and Barney did not speak with each other about the incident immediately. This turns out to be a common occurrence after a multiple-witness UFO encounter. Then the nightmares began. It was the sleepless nights, along with Betty noticing her dress had been torn that the couple started their journey looking for answers. Betty had also noticed an unexplainable pinkish stain on her dress. Multiple sessions of hypnotherapy finally brought the Hill's encounter with the extraterrestrials to light. The Hill's experience is marked by history as the first ever widely publicized alien abduction account. Not a bad 15 minutes of fame for a mailman and a social worker, although they may beg to differ. Betty claimed to have been visited multiple times before her death. After the three children watched the UFO disappear out of sight during their encounter in Barron, Wisconsin, the group hurried home. It is unclear if all of the children shared their curious UFO encounter with their parents. Coral, however, could not wait to share the news. The excited nine-year-old ran home and told her father exactly what had happened. Coral's father was open to hearing her strange tale, so much so that he immediately began to make inquiries in town as to whether or not there were any other witnesses. Let me take a minute here and shed some light on the fact that entertaining his daughter's fanciful flying thing story was an impressive move on Dad's part. Remember, this was the year 1934, the year of Nazism, political extremism, and the year that saw so many struggling farmers in the U.S. it forced Congress to pass the Farm Relief Act. It was also the year of Bonnie and Clyde, and the year the Loch Ness Monster was seen for the first time. At a time in our culture where life and death were literally at stake, and kids were instructed to be seen and not heard, no one would blame the dismissal of such nonsense. But Coral's father handled his daughter's curiosity like a champ. Sadly, Dad's inquiry came up flat. No one else in town other than the three playmates had seen the curious craft. Also, no parachute was found in the area, allowing Coral to strike at least one possibility off the list of possible suspects. The budding UFO investigator never did receive any definitive answers to her peculiar encounter on that sweltering summer day. Still, she did go on to have many more sightings that inspired Coral to help others in their quest for answers concerning this strange phenomenon. A few months after Coral and her husband Jim created APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, the woman had another bizarre encounter. May 21, 1952, as she was walking along the corner of 3rd and Michigan in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, Coral heard a scream from down the street, citing, "'There's the flying saucer lady! Ask her what it is!' Coral turned and ran toward the commotion, finally catching a sight of a silver ellipsoid object. Witnesses declared the object metallic, with a bright red glow on the bottom. The 780-foot object moved slowly toward the northeast and was visible for 50 minutes. The massive glowing craft was said to have been at an altitude of only 40 feet. In the aftermath, General Mills Company, a serial company, attempted to claim responsibility for the craft, stating that it had launched a balloon earlier that morning to study the atmosphere. I don't think so, said Coral. It does not explain the bright light at the bottom of the object. She further rebuffed the serial giant's claim by stating, balloons are considerably less than 400 feet in diameter and are not equipped with huge riding lights. Interestingly, General Mills was also involved in the melee of a 1947 Minnesota UFO sighting. 
Citizens jammed the phone lines for an hour with reports of seeing something glowing and angry red. The Wheaties peddlers also took credit for this mass sighting, saying eventually that they were secretly working on an unmanned Project Skyhook. The company stated they were working with our government, developing balloons that would have the capability to carry 250 pounds straight up into the atmosphere. Just a side note, the General Mills Company's aeronautical division launched every Skyhook balloon before 1952. After doing so, the company eventually revealed that in developing their balloons, they had seen so many UFOs they were no longer amused by them. That once nine-year-old sky-gazing babe didn't let anything get in her way as she continued to dig deep for answers. Coral found herself eventually writing for the Green Bay Press Gazette and creating the infamous APRO, opening many state chapters. APRO remained active for over 28 years until Coral's death in 1988. Sadly, Coral's life was not without ill fortune. Not only did she die young at just 63 years old, but she also fell, breaking her neck in 1979. Coral watched her husband die at 64 years old and witnessed the death of her daughter just months before her own passing. I feel another story brewing. Coral devoted her life to investigating some of the world's most intriguing UFO cases and will be remembered as one of the frontrunners in the ever-controversial and fascinating world of ufology. Paranormality Magazine also enjoys getting true stories from their readers. Robert Cooper submitted a story entitled Number One Barnard Road. Close friends of mine, Bev and Dave, shared a flat together on the top floor of Number One Barnard Road. It was part of a row of nine Victorian three-story terraced houses in a leafy suburb just outside Birkenhead in Oxton. They'd recently moved in, intending only to be there for a year or so till they were married. On the ground floor lived two African students, Winston and Bobby, who both studied at the nearby technical college, and on the middle floor, a middle-aged couple shared the flat but were not married. Edie had recently divorced and had met Ralph a few years younger and moved in with him. Each flat had a landing with two separate rooms on either side, so none were self-contained. Overall, the building was rather dilapidated, with unkempt front and back gardens. The house was owned by Elsie Evans, and once a month, she would call with her huge handbag for the rent in cash. One afternoon, Bev was preparing a meal in the kitchen when she felt as though someone had tapped her twice on her right shoulder. She turned abruptly, thinking Dave had snuck in quietly, but no one was there. Dismissing it, she continued, adding the ingredients to a chili con carne for that evening's meal. Dave would be home around 7.30, depending on when his work finished. He was a debt collector for the Provident Clothing Company, which was extremely soul-destroying, attempting to extract payments mostly from people living on a council estate. They either never answered the door or sent one of the children to say something like, Me ma'am says she's not in. He was on time that evening. Bev was between jobs, waiting to hear from a couple of interviews she had attended, one of them being in the travel business. While she had time, she spent several hours a day decorating the flat, and it was starting to take shape. At least twice more, she experienced the feeling of being prodded in the ribs and began to get seriously worried. When Dave arrived home, she decided she must mention it. I hope I'm not going mad, Dave, but I keep feeling these strange sensations of being poked in the back and ribs, even though no one is there. I feel rather scared, to be honest. Dave stared back for a few seconds and said, Well, I didn't want to worry you, but something like that has happened to me at least half a dozen times. I don't know what to make of it. I didn't mention it in case it worried you with being alone many evenings. This continued to happen at different times, and one evening, sitting together during an evening meal, they both became aware of a tall cider bottle rising into the air from the sideboard. For about five seconds, it was suspended, then fell with a large bang onto the floor, but didn't break. They were horrified at this strange phenomenon, but before they could speak, 
they heard the sound of crockery being washed in their kitchen. It took a short while before they could bring themselves to investigate. The kitchen looked exactly the same as before, with everything as they had left it. They both came to the conclusion that the flat must be haunted, and at the first opportunity they broached the subject with Mrs. Evans. She seemed rather perturbed, but said she was unaware of any unusual activity in the building before this. They both were tempted to give a month's notice, but neither wanted the hassle of moving again into a new property so soon. They were also about to go on a well-deserved holiday to Sitges in Spain for two weeks, which would hopefully take their minds off the odd experiences. After returning home from the holiday, they shared with two friends they hoped that everything would be normal from then on. Unfortunately, on meeting Edie from downstairs, she asked them when they had arrived home and how the holiday had gone. Yesterday, Edie, we had a wonderful time with excellent weather and enjoyed Barcelona particularly, replied Dave. Edie looked puzzled and slightly concerned. That's strange. I heard footsteps in your flat and a loud scrabbling sound several times during the evening, starting about three days ago. I nearly came up to you about it. Were friends of yours staying there? Bev replied, definitely not. I can't imagine what that could have been. I'm getting really worried now. It had now arrived at the point where Dave felt he shouldn't spend evenings trawling around houses collecting money and leaving Bev alone. An awful event happened, which led him to change his job. One evening he was due home about 8 p.m., and Bev heard the front door slam and footsteps loudly ascending the stairs. "'Is that you, Dave? Your meal's ready!' she called down the stairs. But no one answered. Calling again, she was greeted by further silence. The loud footsteps began again, this time going back down the stairs. Bev ran to the window that overlooked the front door and stared down. The door slammed, but no one left the building. By this particular night, the other residents had left their flats in peculiar circumstances. One night a few weeks earlier, Bev heard some very loud shouting from the ground floor flat where the students lived. It was so frightening that she called the police, and they discovered Winston had been hit over the head with a chair. He was unconscious and was taken straight to hospital and Bobby down to the station. They never heard why this happened, and never saw either of them again. A month prior to that, there was a heated argument in Edie's flat. Next thing, they were fighting on the landing, and apparently her boyfriend threw her into the bath before leaving very abruptly. Bev and Dave both went down to see how she was. It transpired that Ralph had been having an affair with a girl from a nearby art gallery, and Edie had confronted him. Within a few days, she had left to live back with her mother. That meant that the only occupants now were Bev and Dave. Not an ideal situation. Dave decided to leave his debt-collecting job and managed to get employment doing bar work at the Hamilton Hotel. It meant he would be home more often, which pleased Bev considerably. By coincidence, a lady working there as a barmaid also lived in Barnard Road at the opposite end. One evening during a break, Dave explained to Rita about the problems they were having at number one. As she listened, her eyes grew wider and wider, and she said what she was about to tell him would shock him. She had been in a very abusive relationship for years and decided to finally leave her husband. A week later, he committed suicide. After several weeks at her new flat, she started hearing strange noises and lights were continually going out no matter how many times the bulbs were changed. That immediately scared Dave, as that had been happening in their building, too. When she told him that hearing footsteps going up the stairs and down was a regular occurrence, even in the house next door, he became very alarmed. That would explain what Bev had experienced one evening. Simultaneously, while all these strange events were taking place, they had a very difficult and unbalanced neighbor living in a flat exactly opposite. He would balance a transistor radio cassette player on the window ledge and play tapes loudly of Adolf Hitler's speeches. If anyone complained, he would shout out comments like, "'You will soon be dead!' and may your legs drop off. Dave reported this activity to the police several times, but after lying low for a week or two, the man would renew his weird behavior. 
He eventually spent several months in prison when neighbors drew up a petition and he was arrested for disturbing the peace. The final straw in this unsettling time was when Bev and Dave invited three of their friends for a meal one evening. The conversation eventually touched on the subject of them being haunted. The response was that their friends thought it was very hilarious and laughed their heads off. Despite it being a sultry, calm evening, all of a sudden the windows flew open and the curtains blew outwards in a gale-force wind. Well, that was enough for them. They grabbed their coats and hastily left the flat, hurtling down the steep stairs closely followed by Bev and Dave. They headed straight for the nearest pub. That became the deciding moment to at least leave that frightening environment as soon as possible. Next morning, they both visited a letting agency and secured a pleasant apartment on the other side of Oxton within a few days. When they told Mrs. Evans they were leaving, she demanded a month's rent. Dave retorted, "'You try and live here for two weeks. We've told you in the past about the strange experiences we've had while living here. We'll give you a fortnight's rent, and that's all. You should have been paying us to live there.' She grumpily accepted it. Bev and Dave were elated as they packed their belongings into a small removal van and drove to their new home in Kingsmead Road South, leaving No. 1 Bernard Road now completely empty. After bumping into Mrs. Evans over two years later, she said since then that no one had stayed there for more than a couple of months at the most. It isn't surprising. Want more Paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine, and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO, and cryptozoology events around the country, incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com. ParanormalityMag.com. There's something about Disneyland. The park that Walt Disney opened in 1955 in the city of Anaheim, California, has grown into a cultural icon, and that's not even touching or taking into consideration the parks and presence of Disney across the country in Florida. While there are definitely those who are casual visitors, visiting the park as one would expect from amusement park visitors maybe once or twice in a lifetime and probably as a family vacation, there are others who have built Disneyland into something that is nearly larger than life. Amongst those who are the Disney devoted, there seems to be a competition over knowing the secrets of Disneyland and all aspects of Disney. There are books published and sold about the hidden Mickeys of Disneyland. There are groups dedicated to the feral cats of Disneyland. People plan costumes so that they can Disney bound, a form of cosplaying that avoids violating Disney's strict copyright laws. However, one of the biggest secrets of Disneyland and Disney World that even the most dedicated of Disney fans don't talk about quite so much is the ghosts of Disneyland. Billy White at Paranormality Magazine talks about the ghosts of the happiest place on Earth. The park that Walt started designing back in the 1940s is certainly not what one pictures when they think of hauntings and ghosts well, at least not the Haunted Mansion. Even Disneyland's version of Halloween remains lighthearted and doesn't seem to have a real bite to it. With attractions like the cheery Main Street designed to look like everyone's hometown and It's a Small World and Sleeping Beauty's Castle, 
it is hard to think that ghosts would be lurking around any random corner in the wild crowds of Disneyland. At Halloween, the scariest thing you might see is Jack Skellington or Mickey Mouse in a Halloween costume. It's surprising that any spirits would choose to spend the afterlife in the crowds of one of the busiest amusement parks in the world. However, according to the stories, there are multiple spirits who not only choose to stay behind in the park, some of them even continue to ride the rides. When you talk with cast members and those who work in the park and have been around the park, the stories range from the benign – doors closing and train whistles in the night – granted, many of the old-timers have attributed the train whistle to Walt himself because of his love of trains, but a train whistle late at night does not necessarily mean a ghost, does it? The park does work to honor Walt's ghost by keeping a light on in his office window. Maybe this calls his spirit? There have been multiple guests who have reported seeing Walt Disney walking through the park, keeping an eye on things. Some guests have even claimed that he looked at them and waved before he disappeared. Did they see Walt's spirit? Or maybe another older gentleman just being polite? It is possible that Walt, the creator of the park, isn't the only employee who has stayed behind. Possibly one of the most tragic and disturbing deaths to ever happen in any of the Disney parks is that of Deborah Stone. Deborah was an employee of the park who died in the park while working in 1974. Deborah was killed on July 8th while working on the attraction America Sings. The attraction consisted of rotating stages, animated animals, and a hostess who stood at the left-hand side of the stage to greet the audience and bid them farewell. No one knows exactly what went wrong with the 10.30 p.m. show that Deborah was working. Guests in the adjoining theater heard screaming, but by the time guests and fellow cast members were able to get to her, Deborah had been crushed by the moving parts of the attraction. America Sings was closed entirely for two days, and the stage where Deborah was crushed was closed for a year. Eventually, the attraction was completely removed and replaced with the attraction Innovations. Both guests and cast members report seeing and hearing Deborah in the area where she was killed. We can hope that her spirit is visiting the park out of enjoyment rather than continuing to go to work. While some guests may be drawn to Disneyland for the nostalgia and the entire ambiance of the park, others must be pulled for the rides, right? This has to include some of the spirits that have decided to linger throughout their afterlives. While Disney does not like to talk about deaths that have occurred in the park, and especially on any rides, it does happen. And it has happened. Certainly, if victims of sudden and violent deaths linger where they died, this would be true for a ride at the Magic Kingdom. Whether or not the spirits who stay on the amusement park ride are enjoying their afterlife is hard to discern. One example of these possibly lingering spirits is the ghost of Dolly Young. In 1984, Dolly was killed on the Matterhorn bobsled ride when she was thrown from her bobsled and killed by an oncoming sled. Dolly isn't a spirit that guests report seeing on the ride. Rather, cast members who work the Matterhorn report seeing her ghost in the area where she died, and that they hear strange noises when the ride is quiet. This part of the ride is known among the cast members as Dolly's Dip. One spot where possible ghosts are seen at the park is in the water by Tom Sawyer Island. What is especially interesting about these two is that they seem to be swimming in the water together, but only one of the spirits can be connected to dying in the area. There have been two separate deaths of young boys in the park, but one child was killed by the monorail in 1966, and another boy was killed at Tom Sawyer Island when he attempted to swim from the island after hiding on Tom Sawyer Island after the park closed. Since both guests and workers report seeing two young men swimming together, is it possible that these two children have found each other in the afterlife and continue to play? Probably the most famous Disneyland ghost is also the most interactive. He is also unusual because he isn't connected directly to a story of a death at the ride or even at the park. 
Mr. OneWay has received fame recently because TikTok users have started sharing some of the unsettling surveillance videos that reportedly catch Mr. OneWay doing his thing, which is riding Space Mountain. Mr. OneWay is a red-headed man who rides Space Mountain over and over and over. Guests will report talking with Mr. OneWay while in line, and then even sitting next to him on the ride. They don't notice that there is anything strange about this man, except sometimes some people report that it seems like Mr. OneWay doesn't seem to be all that current with everything that's going on with the park. Like other famous hitchhiking ghosts, Mr. OneWay disappears from his seat by the time the ride comes to a stop. It would be easy to dismiss Mr. OneWay as just another Disneyland urban legend, except there is security footage and other video that catches the mysterious Mr. OneWay that can't quite be explained. While many of the other ghosts of Disneyland may be trapped because of their violent and untimely ends, it seems like Mr. OneWay may just be enjoying his afterlife on his favorite ride. Disneyland is famous for how it celebrates the holidays. Visitors flock to Disneyland from early September until October 31st to enjoy Disney's Halloween ambiance. The folks at Disney do a wonderful job of making their ghosts and haunts feel safe and fun. However, there are a few ghosts who are never mentioned, and those happen to be the ghosts who may be real. For most of human history, the notion of time travel existed purely in the realm of science fiction and fantasy. The ability to journey into the past or future defied the laws of physics and logic itself. However, in recent decades, some physicists have proposed that time travel may in fact be possible through exotic space-time geometries predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity. At the forefront of this revolutionary field of research is Dr. Ronald Mallet, a professor of physics at the University of Connecticut whose lifelong dream has been to invent a working time machine. Mallet's personal and professional journey is an inspiring story of tragedy, discovery, and perseverance against all odds in pursuit of the seemingly impossible. Born in 1945 in Roaring Spring, Pennsylvania, Mallet's interest in time travel was sparked at an early age by a tragic event, the death of his father when Ronald was only 10 years old. Profoundly affected by the loss, Mallet became obsessed with finding a way to travel back through time to see his father one last time. This childhood obsession went on to shape his future career. He excelled in science and math throughout school. Mallet earned a bachelor's degree in physics from Lincoln University and eventually a Ph.D. in physics from Penn State. He began seriously researching the feasibility of time travel in the 1990s. The theoretical foundation for his work was laid out in Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. While Einstein's famous equations did not explicitly allow for time travel, they did suggest intriguing possibilities. In particular, Einstein showed that space and time were intertwined in four-dimensional space-time, and that gravity actually resulted from distortions in this space-time continuum. Extreme distortions in space-time geometry could theoretically allow for shortcuts or wormholes connecting different places and times. Building on these insights from Einstein, Mallet proposed using circulating beams of light to twist space-time in the shape of a loop. By traversing this loop, he argued, particles could theoretically be transported back to the starting point in space-time, effectively resulting in backward time travel to the point when the loop was first created. To test this theoretical concept, Mallet designed a proof-of-principle experiment using a ring laser, a device typically used to measure rotations and extremely precise changes in orientation. His goal was to use the circulating laser beam to create a distortion in space-time and observe evidence of time travel on a subatomic scale. Mallet successfully demonstrated this experimental setup in 2007, when he was 62 years old. Though no time travel was achieved, Mallet observed experimental results that he argued supported his theoretical framework. 
his peer-reviewed findings were published in the journal Physics Letters A, providing some validation of his ideas from the mainstream physics community. However, many physicists remain skeptical of Mallet's claims about potential for time travel. Critics argue that any detectable temporal effects in Mallet's experiment could be explained by ordinary light pressure from the circulating laser beams rather than radical space-time distortions enabling time loops. Some have accused Mallet of excessive self-promotion and even quackery when promoting his controversial ideas. Undaunted by his detractors, Mallet continues to passionately defend his life's work establishing the foundations for inventing a real time machine. Now in his late 70s and a tenured professor at the University of Connecticut, Mallet works tirelessly to further refine his experiments and bring his theoretical concepts closer to practical realization. He's also written extensively about his research in popular books and articles aimed at general audiences. To truly accomplish his childhood dream of full-scale time travel, Mallet acknowledges he would likely need far more advanced technology than currently exists. Vastly more powerful lasers or other energy sources would be required to produce measurable time-warping effects. Mallet remains optimistic that such capabilities will be developed within his lifetime or shortly thereafter. If he succeeds, his crowning achievement will be nothing less than one of the most revolutionary discoveries in human history. Outside of academia, Mallet's personal story and unrelenting quest to build a time machine has made him a popular cultural figure. He was a major subject of the 2011 documentary film How to Build a Time Machine, which movingly portrayed his journey from tragedy-stricken child to pioneering physicist. Mallet has also been profiled by major magazines and networks including the New York Times, CNN, the BBC, Scientific American, and Popular Mechanics. For many in the general public, Mallet has become the public face of research into time travel. Even if he does not live to activate the first full-scale time machine, Ronald Mallet has already secured his place in history as one of the fathers of time travel research. One day, his visionary theories and groundbreaking experiments may open new worlds of possibility and help realize his lifelong dream of journeying to the past. For any child who has suffered heartbreaking loss or grown up gazing at the stars and dreaming of exploring the great beyond, Mallet's story is one worth celebrating. Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.